The Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is the only book that truly reveals to us the humility of Christ. Let us study the Bible, for if we do so, we shall find rest for our souls. Good evening, everyone, and a happy Sabbath to all of you. I'd like to thank Mount Zion Church for the beautiful privilege given me and my daughter to be here this weekend. Indeed, I do travel quite a bit, and so last weekend I was at uh, Oregon for a graduation. I took my son with me, and then this weekend I decided to take my daughter with me. It's quite um, hard on the family, and so sometimes it's good just to come out, if for no other reason, just being together. And thank you, Pastor Robert, for making this possible, and also Mount Zion, you have been a very faithful and dependable group here. Amen. I always love coming here Amen. because this is one church that believes in studying. Amen. And I trust this weekend the Lord is going to reveal some things to us. Our message or the theme for this weekend is healing for the cancer of the soul. It's a mouthful of a theme. So we make it just short. Cancer of the soul cancer of the soul, but we are going to talk about the healing we can get. Specifically, we are going to talk about the root cause of all our problems and how to get rid of this root cause. We are going to discover the diagnostic signs or symptoms of this malady we call the cancer of the soul. And then we shall look for an effective cure for this condition. The cancer of the soul we are going to talk about is none other than what we call self or selfishness or pride or meism, self. And by the time the series is over, you are indeed going to discover that every problem we have has to do with this thing called self. Tonight, we begin with the introductory of this series, but I would encourage you, don't miss any of the series because it builds upon every presentation. It is one study that had perhaps the greatest impact on our students at the University of Michigan. I subsequently presented it at a camp meeting and uh, among the various series I've done, this seems to touch a responsive chord. Uh, though unintended, it has helped in healing many wounds brought together uh, many families that were estranged. Uh, you would be surprised because by the time we are done, you are going to discover that the reason we are impatient, the reason we cannot handle trials and difficulties in life, the reason we get hurt, all has to do with this cancer of the soul called self. Ellen White says, the greatest burden we have to bear in this life is self. She says self is the most difficult thing we have to manage. In laying off burdens, let's not forget to lay self at the feet of Christ. Amen. Every Sabbath when we go to church and the time comes saying, now it's the time for prayer. Bring your burdens to Jesus. Many of us bring our family problems. We bring our job situation, our health conditions. But then why says the greatest burden we've got to bring at the feet of Jesus is self. It is the cancer of the soul. And this week we are going to discover what really it is and the cure for it. We are going to discover humility is that divine cure for the cancer of the soul. We begin tonight with a message entitled, The Humility of Christ. The Humility of Christ, it is a subject that will present Jesus Christ as the supreme example 
of total surrender. Then tomorrow, there will be three presentations. During Sabbath school time, we shall have a message titled, The Faith of Jesus. The Faith of Jesus. You can't afford to miss this because in Revelation 14 verse 12, we are told the characteristic of God's end time church is, first of all, patience. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. But what is the faith of Jesus? Many of us confuse it with faith in Jesus. So tomorrow, we are going to study the faith of Jesus, what we are required to have in the last days. Then during the divine service, the message will be entitled, Surrender Your Rights. America is a nation of rights. But tomorrow we are going to discover the necessity, the need to surrender our rights. And then, in the evening, the final presentation, the cancer of the soul. The cancer of the soul. We shall find out what it means to die to self and what it means to live a consecrated life. Ellen White tells us in Desire of Ages, page 250, there is no limit to the usefulness of the one who, putting self aside, lives a life wholly consecrated to God. So we begin tonight, the humility of Christ. But before we do so, I notice you've been sitting for a while. I have two questions for you, and I'll ask you to turn to someone next to you and answer these two questions. Let's start with the first question. When we say humility, what does it mean? When we say someone is humble, what exactly do we mean when we say somebody is humble? Turn to the person next to you and answer this question. When we say someone is humble, what exactly do we mean? Okay, let me ask a different question. That's question number two. It's the same question, but I'm trying to force you to come to terms with this subject of humility. Who is the most humble person you've seen in your life? And why do you consider that person to be humble? Who is the most humble person you've ever met? It could be a teacher. It could be a relative. Now, is that what humility is? You see, we've used this term uh, so often that it seems to me we never pause to ask ourselves, what do we mean when we say humility? Every young lady wants to marry a humble man. But what does it mean? We talk about humility. When was the last time you heard a sermon on humility? When was it? Perhaps at communion service. Foot washing time, so we call it the ordinance of humility. And chances are, when you hear of humility, it is during time for prayer when the elder says, in all humility, let's kneel down and pray. So humility is a posture. Humility is dressing a certain way. Humility is living a certain way. Is that humility? Well, this weekend we shall attempt to explore this and you are going to discover this thing about humility is actually the answer. It is the cure for a condition we call the cancer of the soul. You are also going to discover humility is the foundation for understanding all the virtues of life. You cannot talk about love without understanding humility. You cannot talk about joy unless you know what we are talking about when we mean humility. You can't talk about peace. You can't talk about contentment unless you understand humility. It is going to be a profound subject. And so I have prepared some handout. 
And tomorrow you will give a generous offering to cover these handouts. It's a five-page handout. I would request that we pass out these handouts now. Um, I have discovered that increasingly we are not studying as a church. But the only people who are going to make it in the last days are people whose minds are fortified with the words of truth, God's word. And so um, with my students, as well as in places where I give Bible seminars, I try to put handouts in their hands so that from here you can go and study it. Satan is very shrewd. You might think that when a preacher speaks, you've understood it. You may very well, but I can almost guarantee after lunch, the message will be gone. And so handouts are the way by which hopefully you can go back and then review what you studied. I'm speaking to fill in the dead spot so you can have your handouts. And then when you are done with passing out the handouts, uh, you can leave some extra copies at the back for the sake of those who would come late. Let me make sure you all have your copies. Can we get started? I assume you all have copies. Before we go any further, I would invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we begin this study on cancer of the soul. We invite you to be our teacher. Speak to us, open our hearts, open our minds, and help us to understand this subject, and may it alter our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. See, we are accustomed to talking about the love of Christ. And I'm sure you've heard many sermons about the love of Christ. We all claim to know about the grace of Christ. In fact, we are moved by pictures and films about the passion of Christ. We sing about the majesty of Christ, and indeed we crave for and claim to experience the power of Christ. Notice all the various nouns, love, grace, majesty, power of Christ. But do we know of the humility of Christ? That is the question. Jesus himself said, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and you will find rest for your souls. The only thing our Lord Jesus Christ specifically says we should learn of him is not so much his power, his love, his grace, but instead he points to one characteristic of his life, his humility. And you are going to discover by the time this is over that once we understand the humility of Christ, it is going to open a whole new page in our understanding of Scripture. It is the humility of Christ that reveals who Jesus really was and is. That is why we begin our series with our subject, The Humility of Christ. We are going to study perhaps the most profound passage in the Bible, and this passage in the Bible is also the most misunderstood passage. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to our scripture reading, which was read to us by Dr. Roberts, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, from verses 5 to 8. Those verses are perhaps the most profound in all of Scripture, and yet the most misunderstood. Let me begin from verse 1. If therefore there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, 
Fulfill ye my joy, that you may be like-minded. By the way, notice the use of the word mind in that phrase. Be like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. That word is used again. This is the second time. Verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Then verse 5 also says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Notice the repetition of the word mind, mind, mind. The word mind is basically calling us to an attitude, a frame of thinking, a disposition. The Bible says, I want you to adopt a certain mindset, a certain attitude in life. And having made this statement, he says, I am going to point you to our Lord Jesus Christ as the supreme example of this mind, of this attitude I have in mind. Notice verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation. If you have the Revised Standard Versions, it says, but he emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We'll just pause there for the moment. He says, our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God, he did not grab onto it, but he emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation. The reason I'm saying this profound passage is also the most misunderstood passage is it raises a number of questions about our Lord Jesus Christ. Was he fully God? Or did he only assume the form of God? According to the Bible, our Lord Jesus Christ, being in the form of God, didn't consider it something to be grasped onto. He emptied himself and took the form of a human being. So the question is, was he only in the form of God? When he became a human being, did he only take the form of a human being? It raises questions. And then the King James Version says, he made himself of no reputation. Revised Standard Version says, he emptied himself. The Living Bible says, he um, put aside his glory and majesty. Question, when Jesus became a human being, of what did he empty himself of? Some say he emptied himself of his divinity. But if Jesus emptied himself of his divinity before he became a human being, then the person who came here and walked the streets of Nazareth was not God. So the question is, what did he empty himself of? Off. If time had allowed, I would have posed this question and you are going to discover you may be confused. You might have taken it for granted that you knew, but perhaps you never looked carefully at this subject. It is a subject that has confused many and consequently we do not fully know who Jesus was and perhaps even who he is today. But as we probe this subject, you are going to discover it is going to reveal to us something about our Lord Jesus Christ and his humility. And in that, we are going to find the cure for our cancer of the soul. And so I would invite you to take a look at it. We'll be following the handout I have passed on to you. Notice verse 6. 
verse 6 makes it clear that Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In the original language in which the Bible was written, the New Testament, at least in the Greek language, the, there are two words in verse 6 that make it explicitly clear that Jesus was 100% God. You don't seem, see it in the, in the Bible, uh, at least in our English translations. They are the words being and the word form. These two words, when read in the original, makes it clear that Jesus was 100% God. The word being, and I've tried to explain it in your handout, being means innate. It means the essence of something. It, it reveals something, the unchangeable part of a thing or a person. And so what the Bible is saying when it uses the word being, is a Greek word hupakon, it basically means the very essence of our Lord Jesus Christ was he was God. And then the second word used is being in the form of God. When you read the word in English, form sounds like shape or something which is, you know, but in the original language, the word form is the word morphe, and it also means the unchangeable attribute of a person, the essence of a thing. These two words make it absolutely clear that our Lord Jesus Christ, when he became a human being, at least prior to becoming a human being, he was by very nature, his very essence was 100% God. If that is clear, say amen. amen. That raises the next question. If indeed our Lord Jesus Christ was 100% God, then the question is, when he became a human being, the next verse tells us he made himself of no reputation, King James Version. Or the Revised Standard Version says he emptied himself. It is one word in the original language and it is the word kinoo, K-E-N-O-O, kino. That word literally means to renounce oneself Completely. That's why Revised Standard says he emptied himself. So the question is this. Jesus, by his very nature, was 100% God. Then the Bible says he emptied himself and became a human being. He took the form of a human being, even a servant. So he became 100% Human. Are you following? Question. Of what did Jesus empty himself of when he became 100% human? Some tell us he emptied himself of certain divine attributes such as his omnipotence. He is all-powerful. His omniscience, his all-knowing, his omnipresent, he is everywhere. He can move anywhere instantaneously. And so some tell us when Jesus became a human being, he basically renounced his divine power and wisdom and ability to move instantaneously. Those who teach this, as the meaning of emptying himself, are called kenotic Christians. Kenotic, from the word kino. Question. Can we really teach and believe that when Jesus became a human being, he literally disposed of his omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience? Those who teach this base it upon certain biblical uh, passages. For example, in the Bible, I think in Matthew 24, 36, 
our Lord Jesus Christ says, the day of his second coming, he doesn't know. The angels don't know. Only the Father knows. Do you recall that passage? Yes. So people say, therefore, when Jesus became a human being, he surrendered or he uh, emptied himself. He set it aside in heaven. He didn't have that divine omniscience. Somewhere in the Bible, he also said in the Gospel of John, I can do nothing except the Father gives me permission. So they say he didn't have power either. Another reason why they teach this is precisely because of this passage we are talking about, where he emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation. But think carefully about this. Did Jesus shed any aspect of his being as God when he became a human being? Absolutely no. Because in your handout, I give you at least four or five reasons why we cannot believe this. Reason number one is still on page one, the right-hand column right at the bottom, the so-called kenotic theory. If by emptying himself, we mean Jesus surrendered his knowledge, his power, his omnipresence, and all of these attributes, then it means when he became a human being, he was not fully God. Are you following? And if Jesus was not fully God, then he couldn't reveal the Father. Let me give you another reason why we should not believe that Jesus did not possess all the attributes of his godness, including his omnipotence. If you read Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, In Christ dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In that tiny little baby of Bethlehem, in the gentleman who walked the streets of Jerusalem and Nazareth, the Bible says, in him dwelt how much of the uh, uh, Godhead? All the fullness. So Jesus possessed all power, all knowledge. Everything God the Father had, Jesus had it with him. He didn't drop it in heaven before coming. Are you following? I think point number three. The Bible says, I am God, I change not. If Jesus, at his incarnation, when he became a human being, he set aside some aspect of his divine power, it means God has changed. And that raises a whole new question. Another point uh, before we, we go on, I'm just laying forth for you a problem to think about. Another point. The Bible, the more you study the Bible, you are going to discover that even though Christ sometimes said, I can do nothing on my own, yet on several occasions, what Jesus did, only God the Father can do that. For example, in John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, the Bible tells us, Jesus is saying, um, he knew all men, and he did not need anyone to tell him what was in man. Jesus can literally look at you and tell you what you are thinking. That statement cannot be made of any human being, not even of prophets. For prophets to tell you something going on in your heart or even the future, God had to reveal it to the prophets for them to be able to declare it. But Jesus said, I can reveal all this to you without depending on anyone. Consequently, if you read the Bible, Jesus could read the heart of Judas. He could read the minds of the Pharisees. He could tell what others are doing. And I, I have in my notes a whole lot of instances in the Bible that reveals Jesus had an all-knowing power. In fact, Jesus could also choose to be everywhere if he chose. I'm talking about omnipresence. One instance, before Nathaniel came to him, the Bible says, Jesus said, I saw you under 
the fig tree. Jesus could move instantaneously if he chose to. And then his omnipotence, his all-powerful nature. He could speak and the waves would be still. He could speak, demons would shake. I mean, Jesus had absolute power even to raise the dead. He had all power. So the question is this. Then what does the Bible mean when it says our Lord Jesus Christ, who was 100% God, became 100% human, but in order to become 100% human, he emptied himself of something. What does this self-emptying act mean? Time would not allow, but let me briefly explain what this means, because in this we are going to discover a profound truth. When the Bible talks about Christ emptying himself, it simply means that though he was 100% God and he did not give up any part of his godness, when he became a human being, he chose not to exercise his godly power. Okay, let me say it differently. When the Bible says he emptied himself, it simply means he voluntarily restrained his power to exercise it. And instead made up his mind that whatever he would do, he would depend on his father. See, you don't get it. Though he had all the power with him, and he could have used it, he decided to live as if he had no power. Though he had all the wisdom with him, he chose not to know anything unless the Father revealed it to him. Herein lies, perhaps, the most profound truth about the life of Christ. Jesus totally submitted himself. Here was a person who had all the power in the universe and he carried it with him. And yet he says, I will not use it. And he lived as if he had no power. And whatever he needed, he had to ask the Father to reveal it. I, I use some illustration to explain this. Let's say there are two sons. One of them needs $50 from the father. The other person has $50 of his own. The first son who has no $50 goes to the daddy and says, Daddy, can you give me $50 so I can use? The second son has $50. It is his own. But he says he's not going to use it unless he gets the permission from the daddy. So he also goes to daddy. Daddy, can I use my $50? In this analogy, we, all human beings, are the first son. We have no $50. We have no power. We have no might. We have no wisdom. We have nothing. We need to depend upon our Heavenly Father to exercise any of these. Are you following? Amen. Jesus, on the other hand, he had the $50. He is God. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He, is omnip he had every attribute of God. But Jesus who had the $50 in his wallet, says he's not going to use it unless his father gives him permission. Let me build on this. Herein lies the extent also of the temptation of Christ. See, many of us sometimes mistakenly assume that Jesus doesn't know our problem because he was not like me. 
He had all the power. He had some advantage over me. He never watched television. He never married. So he doesn't know the pain of a married life. He never had children. I mean, he never lived in Florida. So, But in so doing, we fail to understand the nature of temptation. Though our specific temptations are different, there is one thing that is common in all forms of temptation. It is this. It is the allurement to depend on yourself. That is what is common in every temptation. And to the extent that Jesus, when he was a human being, was also tempted to depend on himself. He was tempted like every one of us. Are you following? Yeah. However, his temptation was greater than any human beings because whereas we don't have the $50 to depend on, he had it. I want you to sing. Let me say it differently. Let's say you have two cars, a Mercedes car, which can drive on the highway at, let's say, 200 miles per hour. And let's say you have a poor, tiny little car, which is the tiniest car I can think of, Kia. No, Kia is doing better now. <laughs> let's say you go. Let's say the maximum speed limit of Yugo is 50 miles per hour. And so you have this Mercedes, 200 miles per hour, and you go 50 miles per hour, and they are racing on a highway, and the maximum speed limit is 75 miles per hour. Question, which of these two cars has the greatest temptation to go beyond speed limit? The Mercedes. Why? Because the Mercedes has the ability to go even beyond the speed limit. And yet the Yugo doesn't even have the enough you know, ability to go even 75. Are you following? Jesus had the Mercedes in this analogy. He had all power, all wisdom. He had everything and he could depend on himself. But he chose not to. We are driving the Yugo. We don't have it. So which one of us, Jesus and us, who had the greatest temptation? Jesus. Do, do you understand this? Yes. Our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted more than any human being in that whereas he had the ability to depend on himself and he was daily pressured to depend on himself. All he needed to do is to press a divine button. I mean, when Satan went to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to bread. Could Christ have commanded the stones to bread? Yes. If Satan comes to you and says, command these stones to bread, is that temptation? Because you can't. Every day, Jesus was provoked to depend on himself. And yet, he chose not to. He voluntarily made up his mind that he was going to live as 100% a human being and depend 100% on God. The question is, then, if he lived as if he had no $50, then why didn't he just leave the $50 in heaven and come without $50 in his wallet? If Jesus had done that, in this analogy, if he had left the $50 in heaven and came without $50 on earth, it means he ceased to be God. Do you understand? So he carried the $50 with him on earth. He had all the divine attributes with him on earth. But he chose to live as if he had no $50. It's profound, but I, I, I hope you are getting it. Yeah. When he said, the day of the second coming, I don't know, Jesus was not lying. He made up his mind that he would not know 
anything that is not within the purview of humanity. And whatever he knew had to be revealed to him by the Father in much the same way as God will reveal that to you. In, in my handout or notes, I just give you extras here. I give you instances, the spirit of prophecy telling us Jesus had to sit at the feet of his mother and he who revealed, for example, the laws to Moses, he had to learn. Yes. Hebrews 5 verse 8 says, he learned obedience. I want you to think, here is a person who had all the knowledge. And yet, he had to learn. He had all the power. And yet, he had to live as if he had no power. And so Herod could tell him, Sir, don't you know that I, Herod, I have power to set you free or let you die? Who really had the power? Jesus. All Jesus needed to do is just, you know, and then Herod would vanish. Yet he chose not to. On one occasion when he told Peter, that I'm going to be crucified, but I'll rise again. The Bible says Peter took him aside and rebuked him. Can you imagine a human being rebuking God? Every day of Christ's life was provocation. Every day he was being provoked to depend on himself, and he had every power with him to use. When the Bible says, our Lord Jesus Christ, being in the form that is 100% God, he became 100% human by emptying himself. It does not mean he left his godness in heaven. No, he had it with him here. Only that he chose voluntarily not to exercise it. Are you following the Bible says the child who will be born in Bethlehem shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So he was 100% God. But the marvel of it is he lived his life as if he had no power. Every move Jesus made, every word he spoke, he had to depend on the Father. Everywhere he went, he had to depend on the Father. Every person he healed, he had to depend on the Father. Not because he was incapable on his own, but he totally renounced the, uh, the exercise of his own power. That he had to live as if he didn't have it. Am I making sense? This is what we mean by the humility of Christ. Or uh, ra rather, the self-emptying act of Christ. And in order for him to be fully human, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2. Let me read again to you, friends, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, that is 100% God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. That's the same thing as he emptied himself. He took upon him the form of a servant. The word translated servant in the original language means the form of a slave. He became 100% a slave. Took the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as man. He humbled himself. He became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. What we are exploring is in Christ's self emptying act, we also discover the unique condescension, how he came very low. When we say condescension, we are basically referring to how a person lowers themselves. See, perhaps we haven't thought carefully about our Lord Jesus Christ to understand what is at stake. 
when, let's say you are the president of your company, or let's say a church, Go tell your conference president at the next constituency session, the election time, that he must now become vice president and see what will happen. <laughs> Human beings never want to lower themselves. Or tell anyone, let's say you are, earning, you are a, a nurse, you are earning $25 an hour, and your company is having difficulty, and they say, Mom, we want you to take a pay cut, $20 an hour. And watch what would happen. We never want to lower ourselves. We are talking about Christ who was God. And he could have been an angel which would have been lowering himself. But he didn't just become an angel. He became a human being lower still. And not just an ordinary human being. A slave. We call this condescension. No one wants to lower themselves. Everyone wants to be a boss. Go to any school. Let's say you are a graduate student, and then I make the mistake of introducing you as an undergrad. It becomes an offense to you. Or let's say you are a doctor, and then I say, uh, Mr. So So and So, and watch. Me, calling me Mr.? Even little kids. If they are three years old, and then you mistakenly say, my daughter is two, she would protest. I'm not two, I'm three. <laughs> no one wants to lower themselves. But we are talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. 100% God. He became 100% human. We are beginning to understand something about the humility of Christ. A couple of years ago, about three or so years ago, I was invited by the GC to speak at a youth congress in uh, Bangkok, Thailand. Because I was a GC speaker, I was placed in a posh hotel. Montiena Riverside Hotel It's one of the poshest hotels in Bangkok. Of course, if you have American dollars and you go to a third world country, you know, you can be in the poshest hotel. So I was placed there, and quite frankly, I've never been in a hotel of that kind. Asian hospitality is unique. And this hotel is where all the higher-ups, the government officials, prime ministers, kings, all often go. I recall when I, the, the car parked at the hotel. Before I even got one, someone came out, literally saluted me. They took my luggage. I wanted to, I'm used to carrying my, no, they said, you don't touch it. And then they just directed me. Before I got there, my keys were in my, I don't even know how they got to know my name. Somehow they have worked this to a science. And then I asked, where is my luggage? They said, don't worry, it will be in your room. And so they pointed me to the elevator. Before I got to the room, my luggage was there. And that room, you've got to see it, is huge. And the sheet, not these cheap ones at Hyatt and uh, the hotel. I mean, very clean. I mean, the bed, you can literally lie on it and press a button and it will start massaging you. You go to the bathroom. I mean, honestly, you've got to remember, I come from a village in Africa. And here comes this brother suddenly being treated as if he's a king. I, I literally pricked myself to make sure I have arrived. Is it really me? And then the food in that hotel, I mean, real food. So suddenly I said, praise the Lord, I'm now using church's tithe. <laughs> that was, and then I took a good shower. I mean, it, I, I, I won't describe the same, but it was really good. Then that evening, we went to the, to the, to the Congress Hall where all the delegates from all over the world had gathered. And as soon as I walked there, I started noticing some Africans. And when you see an African, you can tell. You know, their tie, the knot is very big. Even the way they walk, it betrays them. They, you can tell they just arrived. <laughs> so I saw them. And I had to be a good African. So I greeted them. Where are you coming from? I'm from East Africa. I'm from West Africa. No, as and where are you staying? And they pointed me to where they stayed. 
And then I started noticing that some of these Africans came in order to attend that Congress, they literally had to save for a year. Some of them had been on the road for days. I mean, it, it, it was a bad thing. And then the place they, they, they sent them to live, a, a cheap hotel, Charlie now Hotel. You know, if you are from the third world, they give you hotels according to how much you can pay. So they sent them to a faraway hotel, which was not really a hotel. It's a motel, very cheap hotel. And here is me, another African, living in this high-class hotel. Now I started feeling guilty. So I decided, no, how can I tomorrow be speaking to all these people from the terror, Asia, or other cheap countries, and living in this post hotel? So I decided I am not going to stay in that hotel. I have to go and stay with my fellow Africans. But I said, no, let me enjoy at least this place for once. So I, 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 I did sleep in that hotel for once, at least just to get the experience. So I told the uh, church officials that, you know, tomorrow I'm going to stay with the Africans, and they thought perhaps something is wrong with me. But I did. I carried my stuff, got it in the, in the van, uh, the, 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 the bus, and then went to the Congress Hall, and then after the meetings were over, joined them so I could go into their place. Sat in the car quietly. No one talked to me. I started getting hurt. And then when we arrived at the hotel, cheap hotel, I still can't remember the name, Shalina Hotel. I mean, these Africans literally trooped out of the bus. No one cared about it. I had to carry my stuff. And then I said, why did I come here? I mean, these people for whom I came here, they don't even care. They were pushing me around. They didn't even recognize who I was. And then I said, let me go back. And then it hit me that this was the experience of Christ. 100% God. He had it all. And yet he came downstairs, lived as if he had nothing. And not only that, the Bible says he took the form of a servant. He became 100% slave. A slave is a person who goes wherever the master says. When the master says, sleep, sleep, get up, get up. Jesus literally lived as a slave. We are talking about divine condescension, which was the result of him emptying himself, voluntarily making up his mind not to exercise his divine right as God. And the Bible says he humbled himself. He was literally humiliated. Humiliated, you know the meaning of humiliation? Literally degraded. I mean, people treated him meanly. He never complained. See, none of us want to be humiliated. None of us want to be a slave. Jesus was humiliated that even in death, he died on the cross. Cicero tells us no Roman citizen deserves to die on a cross. The cross is re reserved for criminals, for the rebels of society. Jesus endured that. Can you imagine, let's say your mom or dad, being put to death on an electric chair. And then you go to school, and then they ask you, what work does your dad do? What? I so, know uh, my dad is, is dead. How did he die? You, you, you find it very embarrassing to say he was executed on an electric chair in Florida. But Jesus endured even this kind of death. That's what the death on the cross was. I, I recall the story I read about a rich woman who wanted her biography to be written. I think I've told it somewhere here before. I don't, I don't know. And um, the person who was writing the biography of this woman uh, discovered in, 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 in his research that this woman's grandfather uh, was executed in... On, on an electric chair. 
And so he brought it to the attention of this rich woman. Madam, uh, I've discovered this. Should it be included in the book? It has to. And the woman said, no, don't include it in the book because it's too embarrassing. And the biographer said, if I don't include it, it wouldn't be a true biography. And the woman said, well, then write it in such a way that people would not know the full story. And so this is what the biographer said. Her grandfather occupied the chair of electricity in one of America's noted institutions. <laughs> he was very much attached to his position, and he literally died in the harness. <laughs> See how we whitewash. It's presenting some facts, but it is presented in such a way that people would not know the truth. And yet, in the case of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says he had it all, he humbled himself, and died on the cross. Even, the Bible tells us, even the death on the cross. What am I saying? Let me pull it together for lack of time. Let me now pull the pieces together on what this means about humility. I have summarized this in your notes, I think, on page 3. The self-emptying act of God reveals to us some aspects of the humility of Christ. What then is humility? From the humility of Christ, his self-emptying act, we understand, number one, humility is total surrender. It is giving up. What is due us? It can be your ideas. It can be your opinion. It is the, the, our, the temptation, the lure for us to, to be independent. True humility is total surrender. A choice we make. A mindset we adopt. I think um, in the Bible we understand the meaning of surrender. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 4, it is the story of Ahab who was uh, besieged by Ben-Hadad, king of Syria. And Ben-Hadad said, Ahab, I have surrounded Samaria. I want you to surrender. And the Bible says Ahab surrendered. And these were the words of his surrender, 1 Kings 20, verse 4. He said, My Lord, O king, according to thy saying, all that I am and all that I have is thine. Those are surrender words. If we take the words of Ahab and put it on your lips, and you are saying the same words to Jesus Christ, it will sound like this. When you surrender to Lord, it means, Jesus, you are my Lord and King, which means I am your servant. All that, according to your saying, whatever you say, I will do. All that I am and all that I have is yours. This is surrender. When our Lord Jesus Christ emptied himself, voluntarily restrained the use of his divine powers, he was in effect saying, Lord, Father in heaven, I choose to be a slave. You are my boss. Whatever you say, I will do. Whatever... I am and have belongs to you. This is the meaning of surrender, and this is the meaning of humility. If that is clear, say amen. amen. Number two, humility is surrender of self. You see, many of us don't want to surrender because we think that if we surrender, if we give up what is due us by right or whatever, it means we are losers. And so we don't like the word surrender. It means you've been defeated. No one wants to be a, a, a walking mat, or how do, we, how do we call it? A door mat to be walked upon. So we don't want to surrender. But it needs to be made clear, when our Lord Jesus Christ surrendered, it wasn't because he was weak. He had all power still. Surrender is not a sign of weakness. It is actually a sign of power. A voluntary restraint of power. People think, well, if I surrender, people will think, uh, I, I, 
I'm crazy. I don't have any wisdom. Jesus had all the wisdom, and yet he chose not to use it. True surrender is not a sign of inferiority or lack of power. It is a voluntary act to surrender self. Let me point out again. Surrender is not surrendering things. Many of us can surrender things. But what we are calling about when we say humility is the surrender of self. It is much harder to surrender self than surrender things. For example, I can surrender even a wrong habit like tobacco. If it's going to kill me, I'll give it up. What have you gained? I can even give up good things like eating chicken. If I can get something better, good health. But that is not the essence of surrender. True surrender is the surrender of self. Am I making sense or this is too uh, abstract? That is what humility is. Humility is not just anything posture, let's kneel down. No. Humility is not just being quiet. You can be very quiet and be very proud. You say, oh, he's so quiet. He must be very humble. No, that is not humility. Humility of Christ calls us to surrender self. To voluntarily give up the exercise of our sinful self. See, Jesus had to surrender self. His godly self. Think about it. A God who chooses not to live as God is essentially what we are saying, if we are not being too uh, blasphemous, is like dead. Let me say it differently, or perhaps the same way. God, and we are talking about Jesus Christ, who had everything, and yet choosing to live as if he is bereft, he's impotent of all of this, basically we are saying he's dead. And herein lies the meaning of dying to self. But whereas in the case of Christ, he died to his godly self. We are to die to our sinful self. He gave up his divine rights. We are to give up our human rights. Our rights were conferred upon us. Christ's rights as God were his by nature because he was 100% God. Is it making sense? Yes. We are talking about humility. It is ironic, and I think I put it in your notes. It is ironic, I think it's point number three. Humility is total dependence upon God. You see, humility is not just choosing to give up self, but it is also choosing to depend on the Father. It is it's a matter of irony that Jesus, who had all the power within him that he could have used, relied constantly upon a source from above him. And yet we, who have nothing within us, tend to depend upon what we don't have. Jesus, as fully God, lived as a man through dependence upon God. And yet we, who are human, try to live as though, you know, we live a life independent of God. I, I, am I making sense? I, I want you to notice the irony and contrast. We have no $50. And yet we try to live as if we have $50. We live as if we don't need God. So we want to depend on ourselves. And yet Jesus, who had the $50, who had everything, lived as if he had nothing. 
Humility is a call upon us to depend fully on God. Humility is a call upon us to surrender our rights. That's point number four. Tomorrow, during the divine service, I'll talk about, about this. Humility is surrendering our right to be in charge. True humility is a willingness to serve others founded upon the willingness to lean totally upon God. The Bible says, he emptied himself, took upon him the form of a servant, a slave. Humility is being a servant. In our self-serving culture, greatness is defined by how many people serve you. But in the humility of Christ, we discover that true greatness is measured by how many people you serve. Ellen White says the only greatness is the greatness of humility. The only distinction is found in devotion to service. So if you really want to understand what humility is, look at the one who is willing to serve. He serves not what he chooses to serve. See, sometimes we serve, but we decide where we want to serve. That is not humility. We decide what we want to do. I don't want to clean the, 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 the toilet. That is no humility. True humility is surrendering our right to be in charge so that we can serve. True humility is also total and voluntary obedience. The Bible says Jesus voluntarily chose not to exercise his divine power. See, if someone put a gun on you and said, do this, you do it, but that is not humility. We call it coercion. But in the Bible, we said, he emptied himself. He became human. He became a servant. He chose to die. He, 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 the emphasis is, it was voluntary. When you don't have to, but you choose to do so, we call it humility. See, many fights in the home would be solved simply when one person chooses that I choose to be a fool. Not because you are a fool, but because you made a conscious choice. Humility is an expression of faith. Tomorrow morning, we'll talk about this. And you are going to discover why the three angels' uh, message says, here is the patience of saints, here are the, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. You can never understand faith unless you understand humility. Amen. Amen. Much of what masquerades as faith today is no faith at all. It is rather an attempt to exploit the power of Christ for our selfish interests. True humility, the hallmark of humility is faith. And tomorrow morning, you are going to see what true faith is. The faith of Jesus. And before we are saved, before we are able to endure in the last days, we need the faith of Jesus, which is rooted in emptying self. Humility. So I'm not going to talk about this. Humility is dying to self. Uh, in the last presentation, I'll explain this. Humility is a way of life. It is a mindset. It is an attitude. It is not just an act. You come to church, a posture you adopt. No, it is an all round thing. Humility puts to shame our pride. Perhaps I should uh, go on. The Bible tells us in Philippians 2, 5 to 11, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. I, I wish, uh, perhaps I should read some statements. I have reproduced some of them on your handouts under 10. I have them on the screen. Perhaps you can see it. The Bible says, or oh, the spirit of prophecy, desire of ages, page 439 to 440. See, in the humility of Christ, it puts to shame all our pride. See, it, it is funny. We don't have it, and yet we try to flush it. You know, some, when someone gets an education, they think they have arrived. 
Jesus had it all. He was omniscient. He had all the knowledge, but he chose not to exercise it. Unfortunately, today we get a little teaspoon of education, and then we think we've arrived. It, it reminds me, I went to a graduation, a high school graduation. There's this brother, he came, received his diploma, and then he made a whole show. I mean, this is just a diploma from high school. But he thinks he has all the wisdom. That is our attitude. We don't have the knowledge, and yet we try to show off. Jesus had it, but he chose not to use it. Talk about power. He had it all. Talk about wealth. He had it all. I've lived in homes. I recall living in the home of one rich man, literally a millionaire. His house, 32 bedrooms. It's like a palace, a mansion. And yet when you see this man, just ordinary. He's a servant, literally a slave. And here we are living in Florida. You have $5,000 in the bank and you think you have it. See, when we see the humility of Christ and compare it to our attitude, you see how our pride looks so hollow. I mean, what is it we boast of? Good looking? Rich? Educated? You have a car? A mansion? I mean, Jesus had it all. But he chose not to use it. That is humility. Ellen White says, when we see Jesus, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, working to save the lost, slighted, scorned, derided, driven from city to city till his mission was accomplished, when we behold him in Gethsemane, sweating great drops of blood and on the cross dying in agony, when we see this, self will no longer clamor to be recognized. Looking unto Jesus, we shall be ashamed of our coldness, our lethargy, and our self-seeking. We shall be willing to be anything or nothing so that we may do heart service for the master. Amen. Here's another statement. We shall rejoice to bear the cross after Jesus to endure trial, shame, or persecution for his dear sake. By tomorrow evening, we are going to discover the reason many of us cannot bear trials is because of self. That is why we complain. A little trial, Lord, give me a husband or I leave the church. What is speaking is self. Lord, you better heal me or I'll go somewhere and get some faith healing. True humility, true dying to self is that which enables us to endure every trial. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 15. He who beholds Christ in his self-denial, his lowliness of heart will be constrained to say, as did Daniel, when he beheld one like the sons of men, my calmliness was turned into me and to corruption. He said, when you see Christ the way he truly is in his humility, you, you will suddenly say, oh, woe is me. Just like Isaiah said. The independence and self-supremacy in which we glory are seen in their true vileness as tokens of servitude to Satan. Let me explain what she's saying. When you see the majesty of heaven, Christ, him humbling himself, then our self-assertion, our attempt to be independent, to be me, is actually seen for what it truly is. It is an indication you are a servant of Satan. Because, let me explain this, Satanism is not just worshipping witches and whatever. Satanism is self-assertion. He said, I will be like the Most High. I, 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 that is Satanism. Christ's likeness is self-emptying act. So when you see Christ the way he was, 
and emptied himself, chose not to use it, and you are asserting yours, it is an indication you are a slave to Satan. We are talking about in the humility of Christ, we see the ugliness of our pride. Human nature is ever struggling for expression, ready for context. But he who learns of Christ is emptied of self, of pride, of love of supremacy, and there is silence in the soul. Tomorrow evening you are going to discover the reason we don't have peace of mind is because of self. He says, learn of me, I am meek and lowly, and you will find rest for your soul. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Self is yielded to the disposal of the Holy Spirit. Then we are not anxious to have the highest place. We have no ambition to crowd and elbow ourselves into notice. But we feel that our highest place is at the feet of our Savior. We look to Jesus, waiting for his hand to lead, listening to his voice to guide. Some of us are not willing to wait on the Lord. We want to have our own way. It is a sign that self is alive. Here's another statement from the spirit of prophecy. In consideration of this, talking about the humility of Christ, can men have one particle of self-exaltation? Think about it for a moment. What makes you so proud? Because of your good looks? Because you have athletic abilities, you can move and run 100 meters. Jesus had the ability to move. That's what we call omnipresence. He can be instantaneously at many places at the same time. He had it, but he chose not to exercise it. So if you think you are so fast on the basketball, and that is what makes you proud. If you are so skillful on the piano, that's what makes you proud. Ellen White says, when you consider the humility of Christ, can we have one particle of self-exaltation? As they trace down the life and sufferings on the humiliations of Christ, can they lift their proud heads as if they were to bear no trials, no shame or humiliation? I say to the followers of Christ, look to Calvary and blush for shame at your self-important ideas. When you look at Calvary, you blush for shame. You know, blushing, I never knew the meaning of blushing until I came here because black people never blush. <laughs> Ellen White says, when you see Jesus the way you ought to see him, you must blush for shame. When you show off your little $200 in the bank and you think that makes you hot stuff, blush for shame at your self-important ideas. He had it all here in his mind. He chose not to use it. So how come that during Sabbath school you are trying to show off with your ideas? Blush for shame. All this humiliation of the majesty of heaven was for guilty, condemned man. He went lower and lower in his humiliation until there were no lower depths that he could reach in order to lift man from his moral defilement. All this was for you who are striving for supremacy, striving for human praise, for human exaltation. You who are afraid you will not receive all the deference or respect from human minds that you think is due you. Is this Christ-like? Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. He died to make an atonement and become a pattern for everyone who will be his disciple. Shall selfishness come into your hearts? And will those who set not before them the pattern of Jesus extol in your merit? You have none except as they come through Jesus Christ. Shall pride be harbored after you have seen deity humbling himself and then as man, Jesus Christ, debasing himself till there was no lower point to which he could descend? Be astonished, O ye heavens, and be amazed, ye inhabitants of the earth, that such return should be made to our Lord. What contempt, notice the exclamation mark, what wickedness, what formality, what pride. At the end of each statement, Ellen Wise put as an exclamation mark, she is almost screaming at us. He, she is saying, when you look at Jesus and you still cherish pride, you are showing contempt to Jesus. It means you are wicked. A wicked person is one who can see Christ emptying himself and choose to accept himself. That is wickedness. What formality? What pride? 
What efforts made to lift up man and glorify self? When the Lord of glory humbled himself, agonized and died the shameful death upon the cross in our behalf. She says, I present before you the life of self-denial, humility and sacrifice of our Lord. The majesty of heaven, the king of glory, left his riches, his splendor, his honor and glory in order to save sinful man. He condescended to a life of humility, poverty and shame, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Oh, why are we so sensitive to trial and reproach, to shame and suffering, when our Lord has given us such an example? Who would wish to enter the joy of their Lord while they were unwilling to partake of his sufferings? What? The servant unwilling to bear the humility and shame and reproach which the master bore unselfishly for him? The servant shrinking from a life of humility and sacrifice which is for his own eternal happiness by which he may finally obtain an exceedingly great and eternal reward? The language of my heart is, let me be a partaker of Christ, of his sufferings, that I may finally share with him in glory. All I'm trying to say is our Lord Jesus denied his holy, godly self. We are called upon to deny our sinful, ugly self. He surrendered his divine rights, which were his. What shall we do with our human rights, which were conferred upon us? He who had power within him that he could have used, rather chose to rely constantly upon a source from above him. Shall we, who have nothing within us, continue to depend upon what we don't have? He who was fully God lived as a man through constant dependence upon God. Shall we, who are human, try to live as God through our life of independence from God. See, that is the problem we face. Who you marry, where you work, which school you attend, all the choices we make, the question is, are you going to depend on God or you are going to depend on self? Self is our number one problem. In the light of the humility of Christ, let every mountain of our pride be brought low so that the lowly valley can be exalted, preparing the way for the Lord. Tonight, we have begun a study. I presented before you a model of true humility, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The question is, what are you going to do? Is it your desire? by the grace of God, to have the mind of Christ. He says, learn of me. I am meek and lowly, and you'll find rest for your soul. If that is your wish and prayer, I would invite you to stand for prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we have begun a study we do not know where it would lead us, but we do know that perhaps for one person in this church, this weekend will be the answer to a particular prayer request. We are beginning to see that something has to die in our lives. Self must die. Thank you for the example of our Lord Jesus Christ we confess that we need this spirit. We need this attitude, this mind of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, and speak to us this weekend that we can say not our way, not our will, but yours be done. Let it be actualized in the experiences of every one of us. For we ask in Jesus' name.
This media was produced by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.com. Our address is Hope Media Ministry, P.O. Box 752, Ada, Michigan, 49301. You can also email us at hope at hopevideo.com. Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.com. That's hopevideo.com.